that moment of deciding that this was something that I needed for myself and that I valued enough and that it was worth putting a little uncertainty, a little scariness factor into our lives to do it was because it was going to make me a happier and better person overall. Hello, you lovely humans. Welcome to the Live Outrageously with Lady Grey podcast. I'm your hostess, Lady Grey, and I have had the great honor to interview a number of super inspiring world changers about how they live outrageously. So we're going to share about how they push boundaries, they fight for change, and how they seriously shake up the status quo. Friends, I am so excited to introduce you to New York Times bestselling author Helene Wecker. Her first novel, The Golem and the Genie, was awarded the Mythopoeic Award for Adult Literature, the VCU Cable Award for First Novel, and the Harold U. Ribolo Prize, and was nominated for a Nebula Award and a World Fantasy Award. Her second novel, The Hidden Palace, A Tale of the Golem and the Genie, will be published in June 2021 by HarperCollins. A Midwest native and a fellow Libertyville High School alum, she holds a BA in English from Carleton College and an MFA in fiction writing from Columbia University. Her work has appeared in literary journals such as Joyland and Catamaran, as well as the fantasy anthology The Gin Falls in Love and Other Stories. She currently lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with her husband and her children. Welcome, 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 Helene. I am so excited to have you on in the program today. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for having me. It has been (laughs) quite a few years. Quite a few. I think our friendship goes back to what, 1984? Something like that. Something very, very early. I have have photos of you somewhere in a box that, you know, from when my parents sent me all the stuff that I still had at the house. I, I think I have some elementary school photos of you looking incredibly cute. Oh, I'm <laughs> sure that that's debatable, but okay. <laughs> so for those of you that might not know, our friendship <laughs> was, was very tightly based around uh, the fact that we both love Star Trek. Yes. We uh, and not just any Star Trek. The next generation, of yes. course. Yes. Are we still fighting about who's sexier, Picard or Riker? Is that still a thing? Who was going for what? You were... I was 100% Jonathan Frakes. Yes. yes. Yeah. And I was probably Picard in that, it, God, just like the charisma of the man. Picard really is the sexiest man in, in the Star Trek universe. So we're, we're maybe not fighting about it anymore. We're pr- okay. Oh, okay, so Good. I think I've matured a little, right? <laughs> and we're to the point where we could both acknowledge Patrick Stewart's genius. Yes, yes. And move on. All yep. right, so, okay. I just needed to get that out of the way. <laughs> because this is not a podcast about Star Trek, but about living outrageously, mm-hmm. let's segue. <laughs> I would love for you uh, to share with us What you feel like the biggest moments in your life have been the most important to you? Oh, gosh. You know, it's you immediately want to jump to my wedding or when my kids are born. And those are certainly big gun important moments. When I decided to actually cut back my hours in my the job that I was working in 2000 and three, I think at that point, I was living in Seattle, working in communications at a public TV station. And I had, over the previous year, started writing again. I'd started taking writing classes. It it was sort of a, a, a point in my life where I had been miserable for a very long time doing marketing and communications and writing about other people's work. I was not fulfilled in my job at all. And this process of getting back into writing was me sort of admitting that to myself and admitting that my my career wasn't going where I wanted it to, basically because I didn't care enough about it and that I had to do something that I cared about more. And 
I'd always wanted to be a writer, um, but thought that I couldn't. And this was admitting to myself, okay, I can do this. It would be an, uh, uh, an immense amount of work and uncertainty. And there's one thing I hate more than anything else. It's uncertainty. And my um, husband, he was a grad student at the time. And I was, you know, I'm working at public TV. We're not exactly, you know, rolling in the dough. I said, look, I really want to ask the station if I can go part-time so that I can devote more time to writing and actually trying to make a living name, whatever for myself as a writer. And he said, yes, absolutely. This is something that you need to do. I think that moment of deciding that this was something that I needed for myself and that I valued enough and that it was worth putting a little uncertainty, a little scariness factor into our lives to do it was because it was going to make me a happier and better person overall and a better partner to him too. What was pretty hilarious was that I we flew back from Illinois that Sunday night and then Monday morning I found out that I'd been laid off the week before. Um, (laughs) so it was sort of like the universe saying, okay, we're going to do you one better. (laughs) Uh, it was a pretty amazingly serendipitous thing. I was sort of like, okay, well, if I'm going to do this, I decided I want to apply to MFA programs. I want to go back to school. And so that moment, you know, it was like a series of small moments, small decisions that all added up to like a large change in trajectory. That was very important um, in my life. Kareem, my husband, he had to go to New Mexico to do like the actual research for his PhD. And he knew he was going to be there for like nine months. He's looking at that as I am looking at going to Columbia. At this point, we've been together for, I want to say like 11 years. And so I proposed to him, he accepted, and then we split up and each moved across the country to a different place. So... (laughs) So I ended up in, uh, you know, Manhattan, and he ended up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, which was sort of hilarious. Also, partnering, if you're going to partner and have a creative career, make sure you partner with the right person. Kareem has been absolutely astonishingly amazing about giving me the space and time and being a full co-parent we are in this together. And you have kids too. How did that impact your writing? I want to say that I learned how to do it, but the truth is I didn't. It's this constant renegotiation. Am I working so much that I'm not paying enough attention to my kids? Am I being so focused on my kids that the people in my head are drying up and blowing away? When the first book was published, my daughter Maya was a year old. So the vast majority of my writing career up until that point, I did not know what it was like to write and be a parent at the same time. And that was what I had to learn trial by fire with this second book. (laughs) And I'm, yeah, and I'm not sure, I'm honestly not sure how much of it just has to do with my own creative process the way that I seem to go after very big problems and very large stories that I have to get my whole brain around before I feel like I can write them with any confidence. To do that takes a lot of hard, solo, deep work alone in a room where I lock myself away and immerse myself in something and become a terrible person for everyone else to live with, which isn't the best when you've also got kids. (laughs) So it's learning to be okay with just not being in balance sometimes. Right. This magnificent work, which has been a huge part of my life and my love story with my own husband, Mm -hmm. The Golem and the Genie. I feel like that book is this beautifully outrageous work. (laughs) And yes, I'm biased because I know the author, (laughs) but I also am really intrigued by a couple different things that relate to it. The one being that it does not fit in any one genre. It has completely like busted through this idea of, oh, this book has to be in a certain category. And then the other thing is that 
there's a great story behind your writing this book hmm. from what I understand. Mm-hmm. So I know all of that, but I know the people listening don't know. And I would love for you to share with them that process and you know how you came up with this brilliant idea. When you get to a Master's of Fine Arts for Fiction program like Columbia, um, it's a master's and you have a thesis, but the thesis of, is creative work. They let you know basically from the second you get there, okay, you have a certain number of years here. By the end of them, you need to have your thesis, your 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 body of work written. And this is usually either like short stories or a part of a novel, something that you are planning on making into your first hopefully published work you know this is what you're going to shop around when i got there i had it in my head that my first book was going to be a collection of linked short stories that were based on family stories from my family and from kareem's family my my husband's family because i'm you know jewish american he's arab american one of the things that that continually struck me over, you know, how we're many years now, is how similar our family stories are in uh, issues of immigration and uh, to America and languages and cultural difference, and then, um, you know, being the child of an immigrant or the, you know, having that passed down to you as sort of a legacy and and um, how it affects the way you view the light, uh, the world around you and how it always makes you feel a little bit like an outsider, even when possibly that isn't warranted. I was like, okay, I've got all this material, you know, all these stories I've heard from my family, from his family all these years. I'm going to write these stories and they're going to sort of follow this, you know, Jewish girl and this Arab American boy as they sort of learn more about each other's families. And so I started writing these stories the problem that I very quickly started running into was that they weren't good. The stories just were not good. Um, I, I was doing a pretty poor job of it. I knew it, you know, I, I know when I'm not writing something interesting. They just sort of arrived flat on the page, didn't have much energy to them. Looking back on it, I'm pretty sure that it's because I knew everything I was going to write, and so there was no discovery in it for me. I wasn't uh-huh. intrigued by them. I was just sort of reporting. I you know, got to year two, and I'm getting these very tepid responses out of my my uh, workshop. You know, you, you don't pay all that money for them to be nice to you. They're going to tell you what, what you, they think. I was having this conversation with a friend of mine, Amanda, who was in my workshop with me, she gave me probably the biggest, the the best tough love conversation I've had in my life. She said, Helene, can I ask you a question? She said, Helene, why are you writing like this? I said, what what do you, what do you mean? Why am I writing like what? She said, okay, you're doing these very like Raymond Carver very realist short stories, you know, very MFA model, but that's not who you are. I've been to your apartment. I've seen your bookshelves. I know what a nerd you are. And you are always talking in class about injecting the the, um, genre into literature and busting down the barriers and bringing the magic into stories. and, And that's what you groove on. So why aren't you not doing that? I honestly had never thought of that. And she just sort of, it was like she'd taken my head and whipped it around to where I needed to be looking at. The, you know, I'm still like, but that's not, these stories don't with the Matt, no. And she said, okay, look, <laughs> the, the next thing I see from you in workshop, I want it to be about your families, but I want it to be magical. I was like, okay. <laughs> I just, you know, it was like, okay, well, that's that's my marching orders. I'm going to do what she said. I'm going to, you know, I went home and I just sort of sat and thought about it. It was literally, I think, two hours later, I had the rough outline for what would be the golem and the genie. I was like, okay, what if I take the this this Jewish girl and this Arab American boy, and what if I turn them into something a little more 
Neil Gaiman-esque, a little more fantasy, a little like these, what if these are the emblematic folklore creatures of each, you know, culture? What if I turned them into like a girl golem and a boy genie? I could pretty immediately see these two. And they were there. The woman was like this tall, like prim looking woman who looked a little shy and awkward and unsure of herself. And the boy was this also tall, sort of devilishly charismatic looking genie who looked like he might be a bit of a bad boy. And I was like, ooh, okay, <laughs> what, what am I going to do with the two of you? And then it was just from there a process of discovery and trial and error and being like, okay, where would these two meet? Where they would meet here in New York? Where else are they going to meet? It's, it's like, you know, the, all the world's cultures coming together. Well, when would that be? Well, how about the heyday of immigration? What about like the late 18 to early 1900s when everyone's coming through Ellis Island, you know, all shoved together? I sort of worked with my curiosity out front to figure out who these people were, what their story was, and how I was going to make it work instead of having everything fed to me by another source. And that made it interesting to me. And I think that is in turn sort of what made it interesting on the page. So I wrote a good, I don't know, 15, 20 pages, and I brought them to workshop. My next turn and everyone read it and got back to me and said, this is better than what you've been doing. So, you know, good on you. <laughs> but you're wrong about something. And they said, no, this isn't a short story. This is a novel. And you've got a big novel here. And you really need to figure that out. And I did not believe them. I said, you know, this is not a novel. This is this is a thing that I am doing for fun. And then I'm going to get back to the real stuff. Then the story just kept getting longer and longer and longer. And it would not end. It was like I was chasing the horizon. And finally, I had to admit that they were right and that I had bit off something huge and now I had to figure out how to chew it. And that process took a number of years. I had to research everything from scratch uh, because I knew nothing. I knew nothing about life in New York in the sure. late 19th century and, and right. the basics of how people lived and 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 so on. And, and so everything was research and, and it was a long and grueling process uh, before I had anything that looked remotely like a saleable book. And by the time I did, I'd left New York to finish my program and we moved back out here and, you know, we had gotten married in the meantime and I just kept plugging away at this thing. And eventually there was enough and it became a book. Yeah. Well, we are very, very grateful to your workshop for <laughs> you. <laughs> um, but I love, you know, as you talked about the magic and inserting the magic and then finding a setting and the setting happens to be historical. So there's, it's historical fiction. And at the same time, it's also this love story and it has, it has all these beautiful components <laughs> to it that I, I recommend it to everyone. It <laughs> is just a fantastic read. I am really, really looking forward to the next book, uh -huh. right? Yes. Uh, tell us, because I know this has been a long time coming. Yes. Right? This has been sort of a labor of love, maybe? The second, the sequel. The sequel, I should say, first off, is called The Hidden Palace. Um, and it and it's coming out in June of next year. And for a very long time, thank you, for a very long time, I thought I, it was not going to happen. This is the book that I've been beating my head against for years now. I got the contract for it the week I turned 40. And that was five over five years ago now. Um, and I thought it was going to be done in about two years. I'm like, I I know this thing. I know how to be a writer now. I know how to write a book. And they tell you not to do that. They tell you every book kills you over, you know, and it puts you right back in the beginner spot. For two years in, in grad school, I listened to writers say that over and over again. And there's always that part of your brain that's like, yeah, but not me. Of course right. for them, but right. not me. <laughs> I honestly don't think it's arrogance. It's the brain just protecting itself so that you will actually do the thing when, when you have to. The book ended up taking a lot longer than I wanted it to. I have incredibly patient people that I work with. I have an agent who is just, I couldn't ask for anyone better to represent me. 
who has to listen to me on my phone and sort of on the phone beat myself up over, you know, I'm not as far along as I want to be. That's okay, Helene. That's okay. And then a, an editor at HarperCollins who basically at one point just sort of gave me an extra year and said, okay, you know, I, I read where things are and they're, it's good, but let's give you another year to really nail this thing down. And I was like, Oh, thank God. You know, this is this is <laughs> the stuff that not every writer gets. And yes, I have I have some talent. There are a lot of people out there with talent who do not get, you know, slack cut for them by the people around them. And so I am feeling very, very grateful about that. I think it's it's a testimony to how wonderful the first book was and what happened when you were given the time and space to really develop your dream of this story. <laughs> I'm thoroughly looking forward to it. I'm curious. Uh, I have tried my hand at writing. I've gotten two or three projects started, outlined, you know, ready to go. And like you said, they, they just mm -hmm. lay flat on the page. You know, I'm sure that there are people out there listening to this right now who have beautiful stories to tell, and they have this incredible message to share with the world, whatever that might be. But you know, staying motivated when the, when the writing just doesn't yeah. flow is, I think it's one of the hardest things. Oh, and yeah. I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear your thoughts on like how you sort of jury rig the motivation, like how, what happens when you just have to write that? Oh, it's the worst. It is the worst. Cause it's like, you, you just, every word starts to feel like a stone, like just plod, <laughs> plod, right. plod. I think part of what I try to do when that happens is to get curious about why. What if I try writing it from someone else's perspective? What if mm. I go back and see if, you know, maybe I veered off course, you know, a chapter ago? That that happens to me actually fairly often. If I feel like something just is not working on the page it's not the fault of whatever is happening then i screwed up somewhere but somewhere behind me is is the wrong turn so i you know go back and and try to figure out where that was is in it can start to feel like the games where you put a ball in the top and it sort of mm -hmm. goes down and it's like a logic puzzle and, and it can go any number of directions. And there's like 15 slots in the bottom where the ball can end up. One of those is where you want the ball to be, but you don't necessarily know which one. And the only way you can figure out is you get the ball on the bottom and you're like, oh, no, I don't like it there. That's the wrong one. Well, back it up a bit. Where can what if I back it up to here and then do something different? Can it go there? It's this combination of learning the story as you go along and trying to figure out what shape the narrative needs to take that results in all of these m tiny little decisions and sometimes what it takes is just letting a character do something completely bizarre to just see what everyone else does. <laughs> okay. And that can help you figure out the characters. That can help you figure out maybe where the back of your mind really does want the story to go. There's a woman named Erin Morgenstern. She's a writer who wrote an incredibly popular book called The Night Circus. That um, oh, I love that book. Isn't, isn't it? great mm -hmm. and it's it, mm -hmm. it's like one of the books that if, if you do the venn diagram of writers you know if you if you like this book you'll like that book we our books sort of sometimes end up in the, sure. in the same pile yep. and she she wrote the first draft during NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month years and mm -hmm. years ago she was writing about it on on Twitter and she said often the night circus gets called out for you know being written during NaNoWriMo and she said what you need to know is that in that first draft the draft was going so poorly and the characters to me were so boring that I got desperate and sent them to a circus and that <laughs> is how the book began that is that was like oh, when the book goodness. really began and so I think sometimes you have to just do that. You have to just mm -hmm. say, okay, look, this is obviously not happening the way I want it to. Maybe there's another way. 
And, you know, even if it's just the, you know, you send them to a circus and then three pages later, you're like, okay, well, that was fun. And now they're back from the circus. At least you've gotten that little bit of a break to maybe let the back of your brain gnaw on something and spit out an answer. Yeah. So I'm curious how you turn on like the magical, outrageous flow of creativity in that moment. How do you get your imagination to reflect back magically on the page? Um, I honestly think some of it is cutting yourself some slack. And we are so hard on ourselves, especially for those of us, you know, when we are writing in our precious free moments and the words aren't coming and it just makes it that much worse because of it, that we're like, this is the hour that I carved out for myself through blood, sweat and tears. And now I'm sitting here and I am hating everything that I'm writing. And then you're just like, it's, it, it's, it's just not going to go anywhere at that point. Honestly, just back to basics, write some silly stuff, do the three page brain dump you know, just writing words without stopping, even if it's you're saying elephant over and over again for three paragraphs or whatever it is. Just let yourself let something go because otherwise we're just wound so tightly. There has to be a certain looseness. Put the two things together that weren't necessarily supposed to be together. You have to allow space for that to happen. And I say that the least loose person in the world i am very tightly wound <laughs> but at the same time it's it's there is a certain amount of that in the process it's the most confounding part but it's also like where a lot of the magic happens well and it sounds very familiar to me in my creative process with with dance or whatever it is that i'm creating i have a lot of you know improvisation that i do right and you chuck it because it's just ugh, garbage yeah. right whatever <laughs> Yeah. But you just keep going until you land on an idea. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I even have to go looking for inspiration. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think I have a hard time picking books to read while I'm writing because I don't want to pick something that is going to bring me far enough out of my mindset that it's going to sort of end up dragging the book along with it. So I end up reading mm -hmm. a lot of books that have a really strong sense of place with characters that notice details, books that are complete worlds that someone has created. There's a writer named N.K. Jemison who wrote a trilogy where all three books won Hugo's, and she was the first person to ever do that three times in a row. And the first book is called The Fifth Season, and it's this world that she created where every so often every number of years there's a major geological event and the entire society comes crumbling down and they have to restart again it's a story about slavery and inequality and making the world right and what it takes like that the pain and, and and sacrifice that it takes to, to to make things right and how damaging it can be to a person and it's this insanely good trilogy. There's so many trilogies that you read. And I, I, I say this as a person who has written one book, has now written a sequel, and now people are asking me if it, they're going to be a third. And th <laughs> right. There are so many trilogies you read where it's like, well, you had a really good idea for a book, didn't you? You had a really good idea for one book, and then they made you write two more. This trilogy is not that. It just kept getting bigger and better and wilder. And you're seeing the, the, the world getting filled in and everything just taking on so much more emotional resonance. The ending was just spectacular. I sat back from it and I was like, how in the world did she write this? How did she write this without going off and living in a monastery for a decade to do it? How is she a person in the world, like using social media and having relationships with her friends <laughs> and not, you know, off like Jimi Hendrix and his guitar, like just, you know, immersing herself in this thing? What kind of a mind does that take? There, There's a certain amount of prof professional jealousy in there, too, of course, but... It's also like, show me how you did that. It's like magicians who want to learn each other's tricks. And I'm like, you put those words together in that particular order, and no one has ever done that before. And how did you come up on that? That's what keeps me going in my writing as 
sort of inspiration to to match that, to do something, to write a sentence or a story or a paragraph that is going to make a person feel something resonant. That to me, I think, is is how I get my inspiration. Because you get to a certain point where you're like, it's all just words. It's all words. People have been writing words for like years hasn't someone written this sentence before my god this is boring and then you have to like go and find something that fills fills the well back up that is like nope nope no writing still matters this is still awesome stuff that i get to do and i just have to keep at it so i feel this deep in my bones when you're talking (laughs) about this i feel like it's just lovely to you know hear how other people stay motivated like you have a deadline, right? I'm, I'm right now. I have no deadlines because nobody's oh. performing live. Uh, but if, if you have a deadline, you know there are some real kind of tricks that you have to almost resort to to get yourself back into that place where you're like, oh yeah, I've got, I've got gold. I've got something I really yeah. have to get on the page. I, I would love to hear, and this is maybe, maybe you're not ready to answer this question. <laughs> You've got this beautiful second volume uh-huh. that you have written, and obviously that's still kind of in the works, and you, you, your brain has not left that. Your heart's still in the thick of that. Yep. But let's say that you had all of the time in the world mm-hmm. and all of the energy and the unlimited resources. I would love to know if you have one passion project or outrageous dream or some other thing on the horizon that maybe we get a sneak peek from you? You know, there's a few that have been in the back of my mind of what I'm going to do when this is all over. So part of this five-year process with writing The Hidden Palace was writing many books that I thought were this book but were not. I have a lot of material that was cut entire subplots and characters and things that like I spent weeks researching that then just disappeared from the book it's all still in a file you know it's all still on my computer Mm -hmm. I would love to write (laughs) <laughs> back to a book of short stories um, that are oh. basically everything else that was going on in these mm-hmm. other characters' lives, people who don't even show up on the page. But while this book is going on, here is also what was going on, like a universe expansion. It, it feels like a passion project and not just like the next book I'm writing because I did put a lot of myself into the stuff that ended up getting taken off the page completely. I really want so much of that was some of the best stuff. I just want it to be out in the world. I want it. And and maybe that's egotistical, but it's like, no, I put a lot into this. I kind of want people to see it. (laughs) Also, I would love to do a graphic novel sometime. I have no art ability. I can't draw a stick figure even, but it's such a different medium to just have words and pictures just just to have dialogue and pictures on a page and I don't even know what the story would be I don't know if it would be you know something in this universe that I'm working in or if it would be something completely different I would love to do that with some artist somewhere other than that I think my passion project has been get this book done for so long that that it's you know, anything looking beyond that, it's, I'm just starting to do that now. That makes perfect sense to me, just because it has been such a huge yeah. project. I mean, it really has been probably all consuming yeah. in a lot of ways. So now I want to segue a little bit. We're going to call it Helene's Outrageous Advice. Ooh, okay. You gave some great advice earlier to people who are writing. Uh huh. Do you have any outrageous advice? or people in general that might not be writers, but are things that you do either to uh, keep yourself creative or juggle your being a mom, or uh, maybe it is simply how you stock your bar. And that's (laughs) kind of outrageous. Uh, Does something come to mind that's outrageous that you would encourage other people to give a try? You know, it's funny. You warned me in advance that this was coming. And... And I, I, I put some hard thought into it 
because <laughs> it probably has come across that I'm pretty much a 45 year old mom and that's <laughs> That's I've, outrageous isn't something I think of myself as, but I am too. And I totally think you're not only outrageous, but magical. Okay. Okay. Welcome good. Welcome to the tribe. Good. I have probably out of whack ideas about what that actually means, but I think everyone should have something they do, some hobby or pastime or collection or something that has no redeeming value whatsoever, except for the fact that it makes you happy. Just going back to this idea of how precious our time is and how overplanned we get and how we, especially those of us with kids, it's like every moment has to be occupied with something purposeful and enriching and hopefully multitasking and a value add. And we've all got our side hustles and we, we get hung up on this like productivity stuff. I honestly feel we need outlets that are completely unenriching. Mine right now is fountain pens and stationery. So, you know, I was, I was, I've always been like an office supply girl, but you know, now I'm an adult with a credit card <laughs> and, and an internet connection. And, um, and so, you know, I will just go to Etsy and buy stickers, um, like, like I'm a kid in a candy shop. I actually have a sticker subscription that I get every month. I get my happy mail that's got um, cute stickers in it. But you know, th this is this is cheating just a bit because I have a, a planner. It's it's a like a paper planner. It's called a Hobonichi that's made by a, a Japanese company, and the paper in it is astonishing. It, it is a planner, so like I am using it to sort of like plan my days, and in that sense, it's it, it is enriching or productive or whatever. But it's all an excuse to use my pens and my stickers and my washi tape. I write two paragraphs about the day. That's basically like what I ate for dinner. And the rest is just like, okay, what color sticker should I put on here? And, and what should I accessorize that with? And it just makes me so stupidly happy for no other reason that I'm using my fancy pen and my fancy planner with my fancy stickers. It's the stupidest thing ever, but it just makes me so happy. You know, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say there might have been a reason that we were <laughs> such good friends yeah. when we were younger. <laughs> I have a similar ah. habit, I'll call it. I, I don't think it's a hobby <laughs> for me. <laughs> I think it might be a hobby. Is, is it a hoarding situation? Because <laughs> that's what it has, is starting to turn into over oh, here. Oh, let me tell you. Uh, so it's a running joke in our household. Uh -huh. How many notebooks? Oh, yeah. If you recall, we had a very dear friend in mm -hmm. high school, Jenny, who used to carry around a yep. pencil pouch with all of her yep. colored pens in it. About six months ago, I got myself a little 1930s style one because I have so many yep. pens <laughs> that it got to that point. And I thought, hey, <laughs> I was inspired Aww. by Jenny. So nice. shout out to Jenny. Yep. You know who you are. <laughs> Speaking of shout outs, while we're on that, so I always like to ask people if they have an outrageous fan or somebody that they really just want to recognize and say hey to and thanks for being such an amazing supporter. Gosh, I think what I have to say is um, thank you to the moms of all of my friends. My friends' moms are the ones who like, Helene, I am so happy for you that you put this book out this is what my book club is reading and they don't know it yet <laughs> they are aggressively hand selling my book to their friends you know i'm like thank god for you i love you all you know they turn up at readings and it's just so wonderful there's also a guy who read my book when it came out in 2013 and has read it every year since I think it was either that year or soon after he had a baby girl and he read it to her aloud. Um, and then he Ooh. like did the same the following year. And then he had to stop reading it to her because she was getting older and understanding words. And it's not a book for kids, uh -huh. but, but <laughs> no, he still, he not. still sort of pings me every year. And I just read your book again and I'm looking forward to when, you know, when my daughter's old enough to read it herself. And it's just so sweet. And it's so wonderful to like have that connection and, you know, people that, I sort of see going on and, you know, as time passes and they're still, you know, fans and, and, you know, I can't let them down. This book has to, you know, the next book's got to be decent. And so that was also a good, 
bit of the motivation behind not just <laughs> dropping the second book into the garbage. But no, he's a real sweetheart. And, and I love I love all my readers. So let's assume that you're going to have some new readers. Oh, for this. That would be great. That would be wonderful. So obviously they can read your first book, Golem mm-hmm. and the Genie. But mm-hmm. then we're looking for The Hidden Palace in yep. 2021. But in the meantime, yep. is there any way that they can kind of keep track of what you're doing or what you're up to? Should they find you on like Goodreads or do you have a website or, or social media? Well, my website. My website is woefully out of date. The, the, I for now hold off on the website. You know, if you're okay. hearing this like in March of next year or so, go give hullingwecker.com a try. Before <laughs> then, it's just going to be here is what I was doing in 2016. Until then, the best place to find me is on Twitter at Helene Wecker. I am also on Instagram, I think the same handle, or you can just type me into the search bar. Those two places I post sporadically. It's where I also like respond to mail or requests or DMs or stuff like that. And I will drop the links to all these things. So we talked about a bunch of books and websites and authors and all kinds of stuff. So all of that will be in the show notes. Thank you. Well, it has been a huge pleasure. It's so great to reconnect with you. <sighs> well, thank you very, very much. This has been this has been awesome. Well, you are always welcome anytime you want to come back on the show. Thank you so much, and thank you for teaching us to live a little more outrageously. Well, Outrageous Friends, it has been my honor and my pleasure to have you here today. I hope that you took away some outrageous ideas for your own life. If you enjoyed yourself, make sure that you are subscribed to Live Outrageously with Lady Grey on whatever your podcast app is. You can also connect with me personally on Facebook at facebook.com slash outrageous Lady Grey or on Instagram at lady.grey. Also be sure to check out our podcast website at www.liveoutrageously.com. Once again, this is Lady Grey encouraging you to go out and live outrageously.